Thank you. Thank you, and uh, Ivelisse and Jimmy, thank you for the invitation, and uh, thank you for being my patient, Ivelisse. Uh, you know, many patients come to me to ask questions to seek my knowledge in the treatment of cancer, but I can honestly say with Ivelisse and another patient that I have here uh, that I learned as much from them that I think that I hope that they learned from me. And uh, all I can say is Manny, who we just heard, and his friend, there's going to be a clinical trial, and there's going to be a clinical trial in the United States at a major cancer center. But I want to give you guys a little background about cancer. Uh, and so sit back and remember your biology days in high school or in college, or if some of you went through advanced degrees, maybe medical school or nursing school. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what cancer is. It's a big problem, and it affects over almost two million people a year. And this is the graph that we distribute when we do a lot of our research uh, on the incidence. And this side here on the left is males, and on the right is females. On the top for men is prostate cancer, followed by lung and then colorectal. In females, it's breast, lung, and colorectal. And as you can see, it's almost a million cases for both genders. Now, this is incidence. These are new cases per year. What about mortality or deaths from cancer? Well, we're almost at a million deaths per year. And lung, pancreas, colon are high in men. Lung, breast, and colon are high in women. And so it's a serious problem. And this is just in the United States. Worldwide, it's even a bigger problem. Here we have a lot of safety safeguards, a lot of measures to prevent other types of cancer, which we don't have here. So what are the known causes of cancer? What, what induces a lot of the cancers that we see on that list? Well, we know big buckets that cause these different types of cancers. We don't know specifically what causes all of them, but we have general ideas. And the first one, as Dr. Hindenburger alluded to, is environmental. And a good example is smoking or radon causing lung cancer. But there are a whole host of environmental factors that can cause cancer, the majority of which we have no idea what they might be, uh, oftentimes in our food source, oftentimes in our environment, and we don't even realize that those are having an effect. But the ones that we do know have effects, like smoking or radon, we try to limit and control. Another source for a cause of cancer are viruses and bacteria. And the most common one that's pretty hot now in terms of the literature and the research is HPV. And it causes cervical cancer. And there is a lot of work around how that happens and how to prevent that. Maybe uh, therapies directed at targeting the virus. H. pylori, a bacteria that causes ulcers in the stomach, also associated with gastric cancer. So that's the other bucket. So environmental exposures, viruses and bacteria. Then there's radiation. And we put this in a different category than environmental exposures because this is more direct. And the most common one that we're all exposed to all the time is UV radiation. And that can cause not only the less malignant forms of cancer like squamous or basal cell carcinomas, but the really lethal type called melanoma. Uh, and that's why we try to limit people from exposing themselves to too much sun, not to go to the tanning booth too often, and use sunscreen as much as possible. The other type of radiation is obviously the nuclear form. Chernobyl, the accident there, or the accident in Japan recently in their nuclear power plants. Those release radiation, and thyroid cancer is the most common type of cancer, but there's a whole host of other cancers that can develop from this. Moving on, so we have environment, we have viruses and bacteria, we have radiation. The next big bucket, bucket is family history. So you've already heard two cases today where family history has a strong, strong influence on the development of cancer. And what that means is if your parents, grandparents, brothers or sisters, uncles or aunts had cancer, in particular at a young age, and what do we consider young? Under 40 then that's a red flag that family history or your genes may have something to do with the cancer that you have. And two common family history uh, related diseases are Lynch syndrome, which induced colon and endometrial cancers, 
and the BRCA-related, and I'm sure you've heard about these, BRCA-related cancers, breast and ovarian cancer. There is another bucket that we put in, and it's almost a catch-all, but it's age. The majority of cancers actually occur in the sixth and the seventh decade. And the reason is, is that as you grow older, your cells are exposed to more environmental toxins, radiation, and as your cells divide, they also mutate. So that increases the chances of developing cancer. And then finally, random bad luck. You can occasionally just for have a cell mutate in such a bad way that you develop cancer. And oftentimes, childhood cancers develop this way. It's bad luck because one cell, as it's dividing, becomes a cancer and then starts proliferating. So what's the common theme for all of these causes or all these possible causes? Is that environment, viruses and bacteria, radiation, family history, age, and even random bad luck induce mutations in DNA. And that's taken us about 30 years to understand. And using that information, we're just starting to be able to develop therapies to try to help patients. But that's still a long ways off. And currently, we still emphasize that you have to get screened early. Mammogram for breast cancer, colonoscopy for colon cancer, skin biopsies for unusual moles that you might have, pap tests for cervical cancer. These are important for catching the cancers early. Why do we want to catch the cancers early? Well, a lot of it has to do with treatment. You catch the cancer early, the tumor's localized. It can be surgically removed, it can be cut out. And your cure rate, if you catch it early and it's localized, is typically between 60 and 90%. Now let's say you wait. Let's say you don't get screened and the cancer no longer is localized. It's begun to spread. Uh, you have to be treated not just with surgery, but with chemotherapy, radiation, other toxic therapies, and the cure rate dives down to 5 to 15 percent. Big difference. And the majority of patients I see are in this late stage bucket. And even though we're beginning to learn a lot about cancer, you've heard about the Human Genome Project or the Cancer Genome Project, you've heard about targeted therapies or better chemotherapy, those still have major limitations. They're really toxic. We don't cure a lot of patients. And it's not the type of quality of life that patients deserve at that stage in their life and with that diagnosis. So what do we have in our toolkit? Chemotherapy. And we all have heard stories about chemotherapy. Chemotherapy can go very well, and in some patients it does. I have some patients on chemotherapy, and they're 80 years old, played 18 holes of golf, getting a serious chemotherapy. But the majority don't do that. The majority have some sort of side effect, that either whether it's fatigue, hair loss, nausea, vomiting, weight loss, problems with their blood counts, and in some cases the toxicity can be so severe that it requires hospitalization, and in the most extreme situations it can be life-threatening. Radiation. Radiation is something that can be very powerful for a lot of cancers, but when you target it, it's like a sunburn inside, and you have all the side effects of that sunburn being inside your body. That can lead to a lot of toxicity, and that can be quite troubling. Targeted molecules. Every major drug company out there has a targeted agent. Every major drug company wants that targeted agent to be something that we can use for personalized medicine. I can tell you right now, they still are very toxic, and they're not the silver bullet we thought they were going to be. We still need to learn more, so there's a lot more research to be done. Things like bone marrow transplants are taking hold and are successful in some cases, but very toxic and have a mortality to them. Immune modifiers, there's really a lot of excitement about therapies that target the immune system, accelerate the immune system, turn it on. but we're just in the early stages. And we need other new treatments. And when you're at an institution like Johns Hopkins, you have a lot of attention from the basic science that we do there. You have a lot of attention by the major drug companies. 
you have a lot of attention by the large cooperative groups. But it's not common that you get an idea that originates from a patient that catches our attention. And even without the major funding that you might get from NIH or from a drug company or from another cooperative group, that we believe that we can take this forward because we are starting to see results and believe in results that might have a real difference for our patients. So when you have a brand new drug and you think it's going to work, in the United States and in many other countries in the world, you have to take the steps to get it approved. And why do we care whether it's approved or not? Well, there's a variety of reasons. One is that insurance will pay for it. Uh, the second is, is that you'll have a acknowledgement by the medical community that it's something real and it's something that can help. And that allows you to amplify what you're giving just a handful of patients to the whole country and eventually to the whole world. And the first phase, these are broken down in phases, phase one, phase two, and phase three, really represent making sure the drug is safe. That's called phase one. The second phase is phase two, testing activity, seeing if it has any effect on cancer cells. And then three, phase three is, and it's a slight difference, efficacy, making sure that when you compare the drug to the standard of care, that it works better in a way that we want it to. And typically, that is the route that all drugs take. Now, we have a head start with mistletoe, thanks to our colleagues in Germany, and thanks to Dr. Hinderberger, who's already treated so many patients in this country and other physicians like him in this country as well. We already know something about the, the drug. So we have put together a team uh, to look at mistletoe in patients with cancer. And why mistletoe? Well, number one, it's not new. So we're going to be able to take what we knowledge we have already and apply it to the new clinical trial that we're trying to spin off. The second is extensively used in Europe. It does have anti-tumor activity. And there's a lot of drugs out there with anti-tumor activity, but none are this safe to use in patients, and none actually have, have had the effects that I've seen uh, that I have in my few patients treated with this. The other exciting thing is we're seeing that it boosts the immune system. So maybe in cancers that are susceptible to immune modulation, this may be able to amplify that effect. Um, and finally, something that's very important and something that I'm seeing in a number of patients is that when you give this along with traditional chemotherapy or radiation, it tends to boost the energy of the patient, decrease nausea, and allows them to tolerate that therapy much, much better. So we're going to walk down this route ourselves. We're going to start with a safety study. And that safety study is called a phase one dose escalation study. And we've conferred with a number of physicians, but we've found a leader within Johns Hopkins, uh, Dr. Channing Pot Paller. Please stand up. And Dr. Paller has dedicated her career to looking at alternatives to traditional therapy for our cancer patients. And that's critical, because when everyone's looking over there and everyone's focusing on that, I bet you things like mistletoe are going to come up with solutions that we never knew we had. And what she's going to do is lead this study alongside of us and look at 20 to 30 patients at Johns Hopkins, and these are patients with advanced disease. These are patients that are probably not going to be cured. These are patients who have likely failed some chemotherapy or radiation. These are patients where surgery or other alternatives are not going to work. So these are the patients that we're going to try initially with this therapy to prove that it's safe, to prove to the FDA that it's safe. And I can tell you, when there's a publication coming out of Johns Hopkins saying that it's safe, the world will listen, the United States will listen, and it will be because of this group, this room, and because of Ivalice and her network. And uh, we're really excited. So my hope is that we will start this study this year. And there are challenges that face us. Um, and one of them is funding. 
the funding doesn't exist. So we're doing things a little bit backwards than we normally do at Johns Hopkins. Normally the funding comes in and then we do things. But I'm committed, and I know Dr. Peller is committed, to seeing this go forward. And with any help that we can get, we'll start to push forward and start this this year. Hopkins is on board. Complementary Medicine is on board. So we need to talk to the companies that produce this to help us out a bit. And whether it's direct funding or providing the drug for free or even a major discount for the drug, any of those situations would be helpful to get this off the ground. And finally, the FDA. Once we have our ducks in a row, we have our protocol written, once we have agreement and input and, uh, from the drug companies, and we have the support from Believe Big, we're ready to go to the FDA, and my suspicion is, is that they'll let this go forward for a variety of reasons, uh, but one of them is that I think that the data that we have already is sufficient to support this going forward. So that's all I had to say today. I really appreciate the time. Uh, I really appreciate seeing all this support. In a field where we deal with patients in some of the most difficult settings, it's uh, very uh, supportive and it's very energizing to myself and I'm sure to Dr. Paller to see that the community will take their time and come out to support this. And I know that patients appreciate this as well. Thank you.